Welcome to Spark Science. I'm Regina Barbara DeGraff. Today we're going to talk about science, pseudoscience, and society. And I'm here with many guests and a new co-host. Um, I am here with Kyle Mullins, and he is a cultural anthropology student. You are going to graduate, right? Yeah, I'm right. supposed to graduate this term. Awesome. Supposed to? You are supposed going to graduate. To. Yes. Okay. <laughs> and we are here with his advisor, uh, Dr. Sean Bruna. Welcome. And and you have been on our show before. You are in, um, I forgot, it was, I, I think it was called The Anthropology Files. That's oh, the I show we so. did. Yeah. So you can check one. it out. Go to Spark Science now. Check that out. And my co-host for today, to stick with tradition, is another family member. For our listeners and viewers, you remember my other co-hosts have been my, my sister, my brother, and now my father, Ramon Barber mm -hmm. Jr. Hello, everybody. Yep. And he is also an um, anthropology student. I'll be a senior, uh, graduating in the spring. Yes, at San Diego State. Uh, yes, undergrad and hopefully being accepted to the master's program. Right. So um, it's awesome. We'll talk about the whole background thing soon. So, okay. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so today, I mean, the title we, we all kind of agreed on was Science, Pseudoscience, and Society. Because um, you all have some background in anthropology from varying levels. And um, I wanted to start out with um, disaster movies. And I know we usually do our shows, and the last thing we talk about is pop culture. But this episode, we're just going to kind of weave it through the whole episode. OK. So, yeah. Sounds good. Sounds good. <laughs> so, um, so first of all, there's a new Mummy movie that's out. Tom Cruise. Tom Cruise, oh, yes. No. And I want to talk no. about the Mummy movie. And I want to talk about like all that stuff. But before we do that, was pop culture or any of like kind of disaster movies or any kind of um, movie about anthropology or sociology? Did any of that get you into anthropology? Who wants to go first? I, I hate to admit it, but Indiana Jones got me into anthropology. And we talked about this. Oh, that's just horrible. We talked about it previously. Oh, yeah. but, but I love disaster movies also because right. you see society completely get destroyed. But you also see the way humanity is supposed to act, and everyone rises up and accomplishes something. So, sometimes you know, somehow, that happens. <laughs> well, somehow. But it, in the process, you learn about humanity. So I have to right. say that I, I love movies about disaster and society, and they definitely got me engaged in anthropology. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, for me, um, I was a pretty big follower of the zombie apocalypse fad. Hmm. So, like, you know, The Walking Dead and similar things. Is that fad um, over now? It's, it's cooling down okay. quite a bit. Um, but so the zombie fad is what really got, got me into it because it um, not only were the zombies involved and that was the cool thing at the time, but they also had really uh, robust commentaries on the human condition. Right. So, and the more and more I noticed those, the more and more I, I also uh, started pursuing anthropological thought, mm -hmm. in a way, so. And with me, um, those movies and those genres were very entertaining, but that really didn't get me into anthropology. For me, I go back, obviously, way back farther than these two and my daughter, <laughs> and Roots was the thing that got me involved. Mm -hmm. So I was big into genealogy. And with me, genealogy just formed and morphed into a time machine. You go back into time. For, so for me, it was a window going back into time and still being into this, this place. Well, as I think, of, I think of a lot of these movies, they're, especially whether they're disaster movies or movies that incorporate genealogies, they also teach us how we should act amongst generations and the right. different roles. Um, I was thinking of one that is not usually thought of as a movie about genealogy or, or kinship. I was thinking about the birds the other day, a different type of disaster movie. Mm. I saw I a huge flock birds. of birds outside, <laughs> and I went back to the birds, and, and that's a movie about um, different, perhaps one interpretation, different mother roles, um, and who is actually mm. part of your family. At the end of that movie, there's a new <clears> character <throat> that joins part of a family. And I think, you know, whether it's... I do not remember Jimmy? that movie at all. Uh, can, well, you, can you give me some of the we'll background? Have to, well, you have... Um, Just you extreme have, fear. Pretty much. You have a, a lot of birds that are in an area, and then you have one individual that has a car outside, a male. You have another individual that might be female, another individual, and, and, and individuals, are, they're trying to get away, essentially. Yeah. But, well, the, but people act in different ways. Well, people act in different ways, and one interpretation of that movie, perhaps, is that we learn different ways that... Um, individuals that may or may not be part of your family might act, and they come in and play different mm. roles. Mm. Um, okay. And I think of that movie, and I think it's a disaster movie where we learned about our history, our family, our genealogies. 
um, in a way that's very subtle versus, say, Roots, which is kind of a, a much more um, overt where mm -hmm. we learn about those histories. But they're always. I, mean, I did not make any of those relations with birds. So <laughs> well, I, I, I saw it as how, uh, uh, at, at the time in the 50s, how, a, how uh, different ways that an individual should act in sort of a mothering role. Yeah. And I saw one okay. character go through various different roles. And like of, protect people from yeah, these and, birds. And whether other, absolutely, yeah. whether other, other individuals would acknowledge that. Hmm. Um, sort Very of acting or not, and bring someone into a family, right? Or just I like be know. like, whatever, I'm gonna run. Like, or I'm, I'm out of here. You're not yes. part of my family. You're not part of my uh, adopted family that I'm bringing in. I'm out of here on my yeah. own. Sure. Which sure. is great because I mean, you said this idea of these generational things. I have like multiple generations here. I'm much older than Kyle. <laughs> <laughs> He's a student. We have these different generations, but also I love that you were talking about um, these different disaster movies. All of, that's a theme in all of them. This idea of like who is part of my family, who I, will I protect, who will I help in this disaster, and who will I not help? Right? Absolutely. There's different people that come in, and they all play a role in zombie movies. Inevitably, there are people that have been isolated that come together, mm. and they have to decide: Are we going to help each other out? Now we're we're a new family. Um, 28 days later, the mm -hmm. end of the movie oh, is, yes. is all about, the entire movie is about a family coming together of individuals yeah. that don't know each other. Um, and, and, you know, they survive in that case, at least for the short term. Um, yeah, <laughs> at least for yeah. the short term. But I, I, I look at movies, I don't, know, I, I don't know if you go through this or if you go through this, but when I watch movies now, I'm almost ruined in a sense because I'm looking at them at different levels. And it, it takes almost effort for me to step away and, and disappear into the story that's being told. Right, yeah. and that's that's one of the things that I'll <coughs> I'll definitely do, especially with newer movies. Um, is I uh, I want to go into it for like at least the first time around, maybe even the second time around. Like I just want to go into this movie and enjoy it for what it is, mm -hmm. and and I have to keep that in mind constantly throughout the movie. Where uh, like I'll occasionally cook up a commentary. Like I don't know if any of you have seen Wonder Woman. No, I haven't. Not but um, Wonder Woman is a great movie. I recommend it. But throughout the whole thing, I kept trying to cook up various commentaries and like trying to spot out what commentaries that the directors were issuing. Mm -hmm. And it's just like, wait, no. I just have to pause myself and say that I'm I'm going to enjoy this movie. And like, mm -hmm. movies are supposed to be entertaining, and I want to be entertained instead mm -hmm. of you know, uh, engaging in whatever discourse that it may have to offer right now. So I have a mm -hmm. I have a definitional kind of question. This idea of anthropology versus sociology. And as a scientist that's not anywhere educated in this world, I took two anthropology classes. Um, what, and I took zero so, um, sociological um, classes or so, uh, sociology classes. How, what is that distinction in academia? Like what is the science between those two things? Uh, I'll let one of you all take it if, if you want. Well, yeah, for, for me, it's, it's a very <laughs> fine line um, because you have anthropology where you want to go ahead and get into the minds of the people that you're studying yeah. and see how they lived, how they mm. survived, how they organized in a society, uh, if it was tribal, if it was a higher level into more complex uh, a city-state. Sociology, it seems to be kind of slightly on the other side of that line to where it's what they thought uh, and what they believed in. Um, so to me, it's, it's very fine to where you go back and forth between the anthropology and the sociology. And a lot of times, sociology can be dealt with with more modern times for the people of today, where anthropology would be dealing more into the people of the past. But isn't that very just Western-centric? I mean, like, when I was growing up, it just seemed to me like there was this distinction between sociology and anthropology was like, Anthropology is those people, and sociology is us. Mm -hmm. And like that seemed very just like Western centric. And it seemed like when you say modern, and I actually even said that when I was talking to, to Sean, and I was like, but modern doesn't just mean white, white Western society. It means like everybody. And even present day. Yeah, well, yeah. And there's, there's people that study different cultures that are happening right now, right? And that's still anthropology, mm -hmm. but somehow 
I was very confused about this distinction. So what, what would you say as the professor? Or, or Kyle, yeah. As the professor. Yeah. I'll pass it on to one yeah. of the yeah. students. Yeah. Well, Why not? Um, Are you just I testing find it, him? <laughs> no. I, find it, I find it interesting that we brought that up because like, it, it fits really well into what I've been doing as a student here because I've, I've uh, done a lot of commentary on Orientalist perspectives. Um, and, you know, like the typical <laughs> Orientalist perspective that just is sounds awful, that, though, to me you know, as an Asian person. It like, just sounds it, awful. Yeah, it totally is. <laughs> okay. And so, you know, it's, it's <clears throat> us as a Western culture looking at really any other culture and being like, oh, those poor, unadvanced people, we should right. assist mm-hmm. them in some way. Right. Um, when you got to save them. You know, exactly. Educate them. Um, yeah. yeah, saving, educating. <laughs> enlighten them. Enlightening. <laughs> yeah. all, of, all of that kind of stuff. And I've, and I've done a whole bunch of stuff regarding Orientalist perspectives in various classes that I've taken here. Um, and so, like, uh, I think a lot of things that are common both in sociology and anthropology yeah. are especially in the earlier stages of them as viable courses of study. Like um, when we went on expeditions and stuff? Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. yeah, and you know, like... Not the, me personally, but... The whole way back in the, way back in the day, that yeah. was kind of what it was, right. you know, and it's been, since then, it's been moving away from that in a more healthy perspective. Yeah. But, um, but yeah, one of the things that I... I believe separates sociology from anthropology is like uh, anthropology really delves into a broader aspect of an entire peoples, mm-hmm. uh, whereas like sociology can tend to be a little more focused onto like individual uh, social groupings and not necessarily the entire culture as a whole. Okay, well said. I'd add one thing perhaps to that. I, yeah. I'd say that also the the methods perhaps that anthropologists use. Are a little yeah, different. Yes, so let's get into so, the science. So, now well, I understand. Well, sociology <laughs> may look. I mean, both of us, as disciplined sociologists and anthropologists, look at uh, practices throughout history, both contemporary, um, in our own backyards, um, further away, uh, and throughout time. I think the methods that anthropologists use might be a little bit different. Different, mainly participant observation. That's really one of the core aspects of anthropology, particularly cultural anthropology or medical anthropology. Where on on one end we can use data that someone else has collected, maybe it's come from surveys, maybe it's come from observational data. Anthropologists might say that in order to come to a closer understanding of what's happening amongst a particular group of people, as you point out, that we will actually go and and participate in ways that Mm -hmm. are appropriate. Okay, so... So we actually go out to communities. In my case, I partner up with community members for research projects and actually engage in practices Mm -hmm. there. And I think that is... I think one of the main differences between anthropology, at least cultural anthropology, and sociology. That, that totally makes complete sense to me now. <laughs> because a, as you're saying, I mean, as a scientist, we in our fields try to be completely objective, which we know as humans is impossible. Mm-hmm. But I mean, you're trying your best to be not in, not part of your subject matter, not part of your data set. And you're saying that in sociology, that's kind of where they're trying to do this. But in cultural anthropology, mm-hmm. you're embedding yourself. And you're, you're a participant, like you were saying. Yeah, we, we okay. really, as, as anthropologists, we, we can only analyze the world through our eyes. And mm-hmm. we try and understand how other individuals might understand the world. But it's ultimately shaped by, by who we are. Yeah. So the way mm-hmm. that I understand the world as uh, as a male, as a Latino, as an immigrant, is certainly going to be different from the ways that other individuals understand the world. But hopefully through our training as anthropologists, mm-hmm. we get better and better at understanding different perspectives, perhaps comparing them and coming to new understandings. Whether or not we can ever do that is a good question. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, I don't think we ever can, but perhaps when we partner with different groups of people for research, we can come to a closer understanding of how we view the world. Yeah, that's, that, I wanted to add, I wanted to ask my dad that, and, actually. And, <laughs> I, and I truly believe, and on where Kyle was going before, was that uh, participating in the past, uh, that is where anthropologists have to throw away their old bones of colonialism, mm. mm-hmm. to where you are interacting, but you are more or less m- trying to modify their society into yours. Yeah, being, um, <clears throat> being aware to not do that. Exactly. Mm-hmm. And more or less putting the geek viewpoint now is that Star Trek, the prime directive. Right. You do not interact. You are observer. And that, in essence, what I think is a modern day uh, anthropologist should be doing to where they observe, try to understand, you, uh, you in, delve into their language so you can 
interact with them and communicate with them, um, you try to reach out into their religious beliefs, their, their political structure, but at the same time, you're not going to try to modify it or change it you, because that would, that would be preventing you to try to understand it. Right. Um, but that's horribly difficult. I mean, well, the prime directive is broken like this, every other. This, exactly. is, this is a great question, though, in, yeah. in anthropology. I mean, by researching, by being anywhere and you're just engaging in the world, we're, we're changing it. Exactly. Uh, and anthropologists clearly are, are aware of, of our, our history and that colonialist history, um, which survives in some forms throughout mm -hmm. today. We see in, in mm -hmm. some research that that's conducted. Um, what's interesting, perhaps, is that my work is very applied. I do try and change the world in some ways. Yeah. So you don't uh, do the prime directive. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a diabetes researcher, for example, and, and mm. diabetes is its own disaster movie taking place throughout the U.S. right now in all sorts of communities. All over the world. And all over the world. And, and I research practices and, and try and, and understand with communities why diabetes might take hold to present data that then communities can use mm -hmm. to perhaps change a, a direction. So I sometimes stay up at night wondering, by doing this, will I, 50 years, 100 years from now, 200 years from now, be seen within that community as somehow causing some harm that I didn't foresee? Um, or should I have been more of the Star Trek anthropologist mm -hmm. who was just mm -hmm. documenting? <clears throat> yeah. uh, and that's a, a difficult question. And every time I watch Star Trek, that comes up exactly. I think of my research methods. Mm -hmm. you really? Should exactly. I have that objective of just documenting? Or um, are there instances where change where, where data should be presented, possibly to create change. <laughs> Maybe it just says I become confused in the field with everything happening. But it's true. I, as Walt researchers, I think we, we mm -hmm. have these different yes. these different perspectives that, that we try and deal with. That's a great interpretation for sure. Same well, with the, the the fine line between an anthropologist and an archaeologist, mm. where you are discovering, yeah. uncovering, but they both have different. A path that they take mm -hmm. uh, in their study. I like this idea of the difference between archaeology and anthropology and cultural anthropology. And cultural mm -hmm. anthropology. Both are both are in, within anthropology, but we might say mm -hmm. cultural anthropology and archaeology. So let's let's answer that question before we take our break. And um, you had said Indiana Jones, right? And, yeah. and he just runs in and just takes things from cultures, and he like doesn't talk to them at all. You know, um, so. yeah. it's pretty terrible. Belongs in a museum. I don't right. care who that you are. That catchphrase, <laughs> "It belongs in a museum," yeah. is uh, just oh. like oh, everyone groans. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so let, let's let's talk about archaeology and cultural anthropology. What's the difference between? Give us good definitions of those, and I'll let Kyle and Sean take this away. Well. Um, Archaeology and cultural anthropology are two of the like what I like to call four pillars or the main courses of study in mm -hmm. anthropology. Mm -hmm. um, the other, the other two are of course linguistic anthropology and bioanthropology. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, but the main defining line between cultural anth and archaeology, uh, I believe, is you know uh, one is one is obviously the groundbreaking aspect um, and just the overall methods that you would use in archaeology versus cultural anthropology, because okay. um, you you obviously can't do participant observation for mm -hmm. an anthropological study. Um, right, so they're not there anymore. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So you're so you're 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 breaking ground and you're finding uh, potentially uh, relics in the different levels of the strata. Uh, whereas, you know, with cultural anthropology, you are dealing a lot more often with social strata, not not uh, physical strata mm -hmm. of any sort. Way to answer that beautifully. That's, in, I think, <laughs> a great way to... I, you know, it's nice when you can sit back and just let other folks <laughs> take care of everything. I'm all for it. Well, let, let's take a break, and then we're going to come back and really going to just dive into these, uh, these disaster movies, like The Mummy. And we're going to dive into, like, 2012, and we're going to talk about society. Get real. Yeah, we're gonna get real. So, we'll take a quick break, and we'll come back and talk about 2012. Welcome back to Spark Science. We're talking science, pseudoscience, and society, and we are gonna just get into talking about disaster movies and how society behaves in those disaster movies. The juicy part. The juicy part. <laughs> so we kind of alluded to The Mummy, 2012. So what do we wanna tackle first? Well, I'll talk about how I see movies, and you talked a little bit about this, of how you know the, the ways we, we go in and watch movies maybe as anthropologists, and sometimes we struggle between enjoying the movie and then analyzing it. Yeah. 
I'll just say I view movies and I'm, I'm watching for characters and um, that tell us how we're supposed to act in society. Uh, I look for how certain norms are, are reinforced. So when I watch something, I see a character that's teaching me a lesson uh, right. as a way of acting or not acting. Um, I see myths that maybe I can act out later on as a, as a costume for Halloween, or maybe as I'm <laughs> eating my cereal, okay. my my cereal, I'm I'm re, you know reliving Star Wars as I look at the cereal box with with uh, Star Wars characters on yeah. it. I see how movies sort of tell me as an individual out in society how I should live. And, and what do um, they trigger to, right? And sometimes it's, you know, I, I, I learn something perhaps I'm doing wrong or I should be doing differently. Yeah. Um, uh, unless perhaps in a, it's an independent film which might be purposefully showing me something different. Mm -hmm. In yeah. which case, it comes all back again and I have the same experience. So I, I view movies, disaster movies in particular, um, from from that lens right there. Can I add to that and, and this idea of when you're looking at the characters, I spend way too much time and I think I too much brain power on who does the director, who does the movie maker want me to like? Who do they want hmm. me to not like? That's you know, and what what does that say about our society that this is the trope in which we as like we can identify like every man is a white man, right? Like we can all identify with him, but if it's somebody else, we can't really identify with him, right? Like who is it that's, you know, we're supposed to kind of root for and who is it that we're supposed to like boo, you know? The way I see a, a lot of disaster movies yeah. is is about reinforcing and, and, and developing and reinforcing different types of characters. Yeah. And that each have their own narratives in a situation and that we identify with them and say, would I be that person? Would I be mm -hmm. this yeah. person? What would I do in this scenario? And there could be the most outrageous I idea, like the core, is mm -hmm. an absolutely outrageous idea. Yeah. But there are different characters that are acting in a certain way, and we identify with those. And we say, yeah. you know what? Here's what I would do. The mummy, which one am I in the mummy? Who would I yeah. be mm -hmm. when something like that happens? Uh, would I be the individual that's loading up gold on a camel and going to get out there? Or would I, I be the individual him. that He's gets by two six shooters yeah. and runs you know, into the cloud? Which yeah. one would I be? And I think. I think that's why they're so appealing, not because they may be true or not true, but, but because we yeah. really reflect on ourselves. Let me rephrase that question then. My question then is, which disaster ma movie made you think most, like actually tapped more into your, your anthropology training than let's say one that was mm. just like sheer candy? Uh, any of the zombie movies, biological contagion, mm -hmm. outbreak type outbreak, movies, yeah, uh, because uh, oftentimes the science in those, is, it, it really varies whether it's, it's good or bad. And there's glimpses of really wonderful yeah. science, but there's also this unknown, this fear of right. something we can't control. Like we know just enough in society about perhaps viruses and biology and DNA, but maybe not enough to understand the science behind it. But again, you have um, an entire suite of characters, and yeah. you'll identify with one or more of those. And, and those you'll I identify with the medical those I, I look at those, and and I <laughs> yeah. as a medical anthropologist, <laughs> yeah. especially as we have outbreaks with with yeah. Ebola and, yes. and different diseases around the world. In real life, yeah. I watch mm -hmm. the movies, and I, I look at those, and I say, Wow, um, what would what would I do in these sorts of roles? And I look at those, mm -hmm. and I see them. You know, those perhaps draw me in more if I at least try to get rid of my anthro lens and just enjoy the movie. Right. So, I mean, I, I'm not an anthropologist, so I, I, I don't look at things as much um, from that lens, but what about you, Dad? A, a movie that made you think about when you're currently, because you just you know, went back to school, now you're in, at San Diego State, what has kind of like gotten you, gotten all of your anthropology skills as you're watching a movie? Um, so much, probably not so much anthropology, but more or less the analytical mind. Yeah. And that would be a, a big part of being an anthropologist. Uh, to where you measure and you you get into the writer's head, you get into the director, and you get into the actors, and they're trying to fulfill the words on the paper. And when you have good writing, it makes it to be a good film, and then it becomes entertaining. Yeah. Um, there's not that many movies out there that actually are real life, uh, live and true to an anthropologist to where uh, you you got apocalypto uh, to where yeah. it was a, a view of the Maya, but there was a lot of drama, docudrama put it into there. Mm -hmm. Embellishment. Where, exactly. Um, I'm glad to, you talked about that. I never saw that. But God. <laughs> to where you have to put that aside uh, as an anthropologist, like, and being a minus, okay, put that aside and just 
go with it. Yeah. And I think that's what you're trying to relay, that y you have to just uh, put that aside and say, okay, is this going to entertain me or am I going to walk out in the middle of a movie? Yeah. I've never <laughs> done that yet. Doesn't it show a, a little window into our society that there are these disaster movies that are these huge things that we as humans are, I mean, let's not kid ourselves, we're afraid of these things. We have no control over the mm -hmm. big earthquake that's going to come or an asteroid. But in the movie, somehow we have some essence of control. Like we do as a, as a society, as the human race, we, some of us survive, some of us fix it, right? Isn't there something a, that says something about us that, that's part of like almost every disaster movie? I think so. I think they're speaking about, you know, fears of that are that are out there, but also fears at a given time. I think movies are coming out at a specific time. Right. So um, I don't know. The, the mummy is something supernatural that causes right. or or could cause the end of the world. Um, some individuals open up a, a casket and there's a, a a curse and so on and so forth. It's right. the end of the world. Um, Twenty twelve comes along and. The world is somehow changed. Uh, environmental issues are in a, a different perspective. The way yeah. that we're interacting with the world around us, the debates happening in society are more about environment, about ecology, mm -hmm. about the politics of managing these. So the fear is no longer something supernatural that we've never heard of or perhaps we shouldn't disturb. The fear is now an environmental thing that perhaps outside of the movie theater we should be addressing it. And if we don't, and this is the, the morality lesson of, of that movie, if we don't address it, you know, what, ha what happens on the screen is going to happen outside of the theater. So, Which plays, I, I think, I think it, the pseudoscience thing, too, I right? I think like, so. That, that, well, that yeah. makes it exciting. Yeah. Um, it's the pseudoscience. That's, yeah. the, that's the fun yeah. part of the what if. Yeah, and uh, it's not even a disaster movie, but I think one of the movies that engages the most anthropological thought for me is Interstellar. Um, really? Yes. Not, not to mention that it's one of my favorite movies ever. Mm, don't but... listen to one of our shows. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you tore we, it apart. Oh, I, yeah. I, I remember uh, crewing for that one. But, yeah, okay. Um, <laughs> but, but yeah, that one, that one still, it, it engages uh, my anthropological mind oh, quite definitely. a bit. Because, yeah. I, mean, I mean, sure, from a physics perspective, it may, may be complete and utter bull. Yeah, right. but, stretching it quite a bit. <laughs> <laughs> but all of the... All of the stuff surrounding the human condition, like it's very, to me, it seems like a very tangible end of the world vision. Right. It's it's one right. of the ones that seems mm -hmm. most probable to me, which yeah. is which is what's scary about it, but also like really inspiring in a way. Yeah. Um, I can see, I can see that it was it was a very human story. It wasn't yeah. really mm -hmm. a physics story. It was, it was very. Yeah. It, it had the human component everywhere. Everywhere. And everywhere. Hope. And hope, which yes. is which is what we've decided kind of is basically the disaster movie yes. essence. And it needs it's that hope, component. right? Mm -hmm. Definitely the emotions. There's yeah. a lot of different, yeah, different perspectives and emotions that yeah. come in, really yeah. telling that human experience through, and through human lens. Issues yeah. too. Oh, absolutely. So many. absolutely. Yeah. Well, I want to thank you all for being here, Kyle and Sean and my dad, who's visiting me. Um, thank you so much for being on the show. Um, it was I, an honor. And I love talking about movies. And uh, badgering you finally felt, you know, came through. This is his... Father's Day present, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, thank you so much. Thank you for tuning in to Spark Science. This was Science, Pseudoscience, and Society with Western Washington University anthropologist Sean Bruna, Western Washington University student and filmmaker Kyle Mullins, and my father, another anthropology student, Ramon Barber Jr. This show was a collaboration between Western Washington University and KMRE Spark Radio. If you want to learn more, feel free to check out our website at sparksciencenow.com.